boy high res in just a few short weeks i'm going to be going on tour in the uk and europe glasgow amsterdam dublin manchester london at onlyforthefans.com that's where you can get your tickets get them before they're all sold out i can't wait to hang out with y'all i can't wait to meet y'all see y'all in a few weeks on tour peace All right. Well, we're live here, so now we go back over to Discord. We got the boys hanging out. We're gonna do a, we're gonna do a wonderful rendition of Sky Optics and Celestial Poles. So we got a video I put together, but mostly I'm gonna be talking through it, and there's a whole bunch of me talking in the recording. But questions we'll have at like you know key points, we'll throw them out. I'll definitely stop and ask, and then at the end we can definitely go through all the Q and A and stuff. I think it's important to lay like the foundation for this. For this wonderfully, wonderfully coherent, cohesive argument. So, is everyone tuned into the video I'm sharing here? Yep. Uh, there we go. All right. And let's go. Hmm. Key, welcome to the server, right? Right, so the, the stars, man, the sky optics, the celestial poles. This is like one of the biggest reasons people are globers, and it was one of the first things that made me a flat earther. So it's, it's this wonderful, like, paradoxical relationship. Mostly they just say, you know, don't look at the ground to prove the shape of the sky, which, well, in and of itself is true, I find woefully insufficient for an actual cohesive model and an argument and an understanding of the things that are happening. So. Don't look at the sky, it doesn't really work. We have to understand what we're looking at. And it turns out, looking at the sky is a big reason of how they turned everyone into, into a globe, right? It lends itself so nicely to being on a globe that this is exactly how they backwards engineered the globe model, right? They took these observations to the sky and they backwards compatibly worked them into the radius of Earth <laughs> and all the measurements that we see and told us that thing disappear over the same horizon, right? So they did the same thing for the sky. And this symmetry right here is something we're going to go over. But again, optically, it would lend itself to one, to one of, you know, very much to the bottom of the ball. And we, we are going to watch most of P-Brain's video. It's like 15 minutes, but it's so foundational and everyone brings it up and everyone talks about it. But 
I got a suspicion most people haven't seen it, so we're gonna mostly watch the whole thing with a couple interjections and some visuals that I added and some additions. As uh, I don't think his distance is right, but we'll, we'll get into it. It's, these are southern stars. Rotating as a counter rotation. Everything just rises in the east and sets in the west, though, for everyone, right? When you look at it, when you see it. This is the other way from the same time lapse. So looking north from the south means you don't see Polaris. You see it, you know, they would say it's below the horizon. Nothing is below the horizon. It's not resolvable from where you are. So all you see is the wide swing of the stars as they circle around it. This is, in, you know, looking north. So the only way you see this optical convergence of the pole is to look the other way. But you still see this while looking towards Polaris everywhere. nice ones from the north to counter it to me the ones in the north are clearer and brighter and more concentrated and the ones in the south are less luminous and seem to be more spread apart but one of the things that always strikes me about these is that if you look at all the stars in the sky and watch them turn into a time lapse no star intersects another star literally none are in a, in a path that would intersect and that is just mind-boggling if we should have you know the spaghetti monster in the sky stars from all the ridiculous motions that the earth is taking you know spinning at a ridiculous rate rocketing after the sun which is rocketing through the galaxy which is rocketing around a black hole but everything is wonderfully independent and never crosses over like that's insane <laughs> now the crowns understand how it's possible for none of those to intersect. It reminds me a lot of that verse, like Ezekiel's wheels. Literally the wheels upon wheels in the sky. That's the only thing it could possibly mean. Non-interlocking infinite wheels. This one is one of my favorites, right? So this is equatorial, right at the right, right at the equator. So you can't really see any rotation point. You can just see the fading off into the, below the horizon on each side.
All right, without time lapse, everywhere you are, they just rise in the east and set in the west and circle above you depending on your latitude. Hey everybody, P Brain here. This video is about the clockwise southern celestial rotation that everybody says they see down from the equator south. And they say that it, you know, rotates opposite of the northern celestial rotation around Polaris. Well, what I want to show in this video is that it's not its own rotation, but is in fact just a perspective illusion. It's an anti-rotation in the same way that anti-crepuscular rays are anti-crepuscular. Okay, and they converge on the opposite horizon to a point much like when they come from the sun. They come and they diverge out and then they converge on the opposite horizon. Well, the southern celestial rotation is nothing but an anti-rotation of the northern celestial rotation. Yeah, I put Two Brain's video in the link for all the channels that we're on. I think it doesn't get enough love, but it's literally like foundational. In the same way that the anti -crepus It's foundational in our understanding and our, 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 in our additions to it. Like, I don't think he has everything right here. And I'm going to correct a few things and definitely extrapolate a couple things and add a couple more things. But at the end, it'll be a complete based uh, cohesive theory. But I think this dude laid down the foundation. So it's important rays that we give it 10 minutes. appear as though they're coming from a sun on the other horizon. They look the same way that the crepuscular rays do. The crepuscular rays diverge out from the sun. And when you look to the opposite horizon, the anti-crepuscular rays appear to be diverging out from the sun on the other horizon. But they're not. They're just the convergence of the crepuscular rays due to perspective. So it creates this illusion almost as if it's a mirror reflection of the crepuscular rays. So that's why they're called the anti-crepuscular rays. And that's where the sun is shining through the clouds. And I found this wonderful clip that I inserted ray effect to give a, this big broad another ad ray of dish of details. Uh, this guy does a nice visual. And and so he finds... Follow that all the way over there. See, it's coming bigger and broader and wider. Yeah, he finds a wonderful example us. and he photographs you it. Follow it all the way across the sky. And it becomes narrow again. So we're now seeing what was what's called anti so this is, rays. This is evidence I've been of your perspective and, and camera years. lenses and literally and everything... This is the first time I've ever seen it seeing in a dome around you it's right you have a, a limit of the thing, but I am to your visual perspective so there we go so that and that's all that represents is... even in the glober is... model they are just parallel right no one no one's ever seen a parallel light ray but in the globe model they're all parallel and your perspective is wrapping them around you as if it was a sphere that's what's happening in both models right and this this presentation this video is definitely geared towards flat earthers trying to understand the sky so and not so much towards globies but some other wonderful pictures right so this is a 3d a 360 sort of right you have it on the left and on the right wraps it around in almost a complete hemi hemisphere right the camera does it has the same effect as your eyeball right it's not just a human perspective effect it's an effect at perspective at a great distance right and this is the whole the whole crux of the model right so you have a counter convergence point i think this is from iru which he pulled from this presentation as well. But they're not the source of the light to begin with. The source of the light is the sun. So that's the same way that the stars, the source of the rotation is the northern rotation, not the southern. The southern is just an anti or a perspective produced counter rotation. Crepuscular and anti crepuscular rays is some strong evidence that perspective will in fact explain that phenomenon. So that's why in fact I'm using the crepuscular and anti-crepuscular rays to show a correlation between Polaris and its counterclockwise rotation and the clockwise rotation in the southern hemisphere. Now you might say, well how's that? Okay, let's say the sun's overhead, right? And let's say you can see all of the rays coming down. Okay, it would look something like this with the rays all around you. Okay, so let's attach the sun rays to the sun and let's rotate the sun as though it were Polaris and the stars, but we're gonna use the sun. Okay, so as we rotate it, 
it'd be a counterclockwise rotation around you, right? Okay, now let's take a ground view, right? If you're standing on the ground somewhere and you're looking out to the south, you would expect to see those same sun rays going across the horizon, parallel to the ground, just moving from your left to your right. That would be a counterclockwise rotation. The correlation here is that he's saying what you would expect on a flat Earth. Right, the people who deny southern rotation to just see the stars extending outward in ever bigger concentric circles. This is the same parallel, but he's using the sun rays to give you something that we see in reality to adapt it to explain the things that we see at night. Okay, from your perspective. Okay, so let's now move the sun down to the horizon. So instead of being overhead, it's let's say it's in your eastern horizon and it's rising, right? Sunrise. No, I don't. Well, let's say you have crepuscular rays. All right. I don't agree with that distance, they will but we'll, diverge out from we'll the get sun. to that spread out overhead and then converge on the western horizon that's if if conditions are right and you could see the anti-crepuscular sun rays all right i think a witzer brought this up the other day on a debate and he's like you know what anti-crepuscular rays are and the guy said no i've never seen them and that's a fair answer right because they're a rare phenomenon that conditions have to be just right all right so again so let's attach them to the sun and let's rotate the sun counterclockwise all right, so what you're going to see is if you're in the middle, you're standing essentially at its equator, right? Right in the center between the sunrise and the sunset. And you would look east and you would see the sun rays rotating counterclockwise. If you look to the west, you'll see the rays rotating clockwise, okay? Because a lot of people say, well, how come you see a rotation uh, when you look south, you see a clockwise rotation of the stars? You know, when actually you look north and the stars around Polaris are rotating counterclockwise. Well, it's exactly the same phenomenon. There's one rotation, but when you look on the opposite horizon, the stars are rotating the opposite direction. And there's an anti-convergence, just like the anti-crepuscular rays converge on the opposite horizon. Okay, so here it is. This is represents my sun in the east, and it's sitting on the horizon and has crepuscular rays coming out, and they're attached to the sun. We're rotating counterclockwise. And now, here we go, continuing to rotate. The toilet paper roll still rotating. This is the best example of the opposite clockwise horizon, encounter. Though. On the western horizon, the crepuscular rays are now visually rotating clockwise as the result of perspective. So it was counterclockwise in the east and clockwise in the west. And just like in my example that I've done so far of the rotating crepuscular and anti-crepuscular rays, the stars also have a rotation and a counter-rotation. They rotate counterclockwise in the north and visually clockwise in the south. Okay, let's break down this picture of the crepuscular and the anti-crepuscular rays. Okay, first off, the red dot, that's the observer, right in the middle. The circle around the observer is your field of view for celestial objects. All celestial objects, the sun, moon, and stars will go below your visual horizon at about a 6,000 mile radius from the observer. No, I don't believe that, right? I believe that it's this. I believe that it's a radius of 3959 around you based on elevation angles to Polaris. So if the equatorial diameter is about a little under 8,000 miles, I think that that's the true distance of the celestial sphere that, that represents half of the sky that you see. So literally take the amount of sky that you'd see on a globe, half of the sky at any given point, and that's the amount of sky you have to see on flat Earth. That, that's the only way that it works, right? So if it's 8,000 miles across, then that represents the amount of celestial sky that you can see, and you kind of take that with you. So... Again, the, the evidence for that is based on elevation angles to Polaris. It changes by latitude. That's how you get the 69 miles per degree relationship. And if you go right under the zenith of Polaris, it's 39, 59 miles above you. And that's why when you go to the equator, it's no longer visible. And he says it dips below your horizon. I don't agree with that. I don't think that it's below your feet ever. Any, nothing in the sky is below your feet. It only goes too far for you to see. So here's a representation I took of a timeanddate.com map. And I took the sun's path outlined from Gleason's book, just showing you the size differential, and then I cut it down to half. And this is depicting the 7,908 equatorial diameter of the celestial sky that any person can see. So he's going to say 12,000 a bunch more times. I'm not going to correct him, but just know that this is what I think. And here's another sort of corroborative video showing a sunrise in Alaska and how it would appear to rise and set based on the limit of this observer's perspective 
right? So when you can't see it, it's not that it's below its feet, it's that it's too far and hasn't risen. As soon as he begins to see it, it rises in the east, it goes a little bit over, and now as soon as it passes by the threshold of his vision, it appears to set and go below his horizon, but really, yeah, it's the still there. The diameter right? of this circle is about 12,000, 12,500, give or take. But all the objects will go below your horizon when they're 6,000 miles-ish from you. Okay, so when you're looking back at the sun, the sun is about 6,000 miles away. Let's say the sun is rising in the east. Okay, and those crepuscular rays come up, and when they get to you, so they, they diverge out from the sun, they're spreading out, and when they get to you, your line here, the divider of the hemispheres, right in the center. Okay, so you're essentially at the equator of the start of the crepuscular rays and the end of the crepuscular rays, or your sunrise and sunset. You have your eastern hemisphere, that would be 180 degree view of the crepuscular rays. And then you have on the western hemisphere of your dome of vision or circle of vision, you have 180 degree view of the anti-crepuscular rays. The rays come up, they spread out overhead, and then they converge on the other horizon, on the western horizon as anti-crepuscular rays. Now, if I told you to look at this ray going out here, and let's say that ray look at the end of it that's 12,000 miles from the sun you might look out here you might think well that's where the ray is that's not where so this is back to the example when you put the sun in the middle of the ae map and he spun the rays around parallel and he took the first person perspective and he said look what you would expect to see is the rays dipping parallel and you saw like the vertical sun rays in the back just going east to us so this is that same example from a bird's eye view now where the ray is the ray is right here at the point of convergence for the anti-crepuscular rays Take a look at any one of these rays. They all go to the same place, you know? Any rays in your western hemisphere of celestial vision, this vision circle, they'll all converge at the same place, 6,000 miles away from where you are, the observer. And I'm gonna be tying this into the stars and explain why Sigma Octantis can appear to not move in the sky during the night. So, all objects on your anti-crepuscular hemisphere, if you will, that's what I'll call this, 180 degree view, at 6,000 miles away from you, will be at that point of convergence. Now, from the observer, let's say, let's break this down into the rays that are 1,000 miles away from you, the anti-crepuscular rays, or look at the crepuscular, either or. But the anti-crepuscular would be this line right here, that's a thousand miles from you. So that's where all those rays would be at a thousand miles from you. At 2,000 miles, they'd be here. At 3,000 miles, here. At 4,000, here. At 5,000, here. And at 6,000, yeah, they go to a point. This point so we'll get into the stars in a second here. The, the stars, the like the sun rays, will converge 12,000 miles from the source. Okay, with the crepuscular rays and the anti-crepuscular rays, the source is the sun, and if you're in between, if you're at the equator, so to speak, in between the sun and the end of the anti-crepuscular rays, you will be witnessing 12,000 miles of sun rays that will spread out as they go over you and then converge on the other horizon 6,000 miles away from you or 12,000 miles away from the sun. Well, the stars do the same thing. They have a 12,000 mile convergence from the northern celestial rotation. And if you're standing at the actual equator on the Earth, you would see the stars converge in the southern sky, they would create an anti-rotation. Not a real rotation, just the anti-rotation of the northern celestial rotation. Okay, you'll notice how the stars are rising due east and setting due west on the equator line. So if you're on the equator, that's what you'll see the stars doing if you look overhead. Well, the sun and the moon are also circling around the northern celestial center, and they will also appear during equinox and solstice, the sun will appear to rise due east and set due west in a straight line, and that seems impossible. How can a circling sun um, create a straight line, or, you know, make a straight line straight up and straight overhead? It's just a perspective issue, just like I show here with the crepuscular rays. See how that forms a straight line right here? Let me run this line up, because that forms a straight line because it's perspective. Everything to the east of you converges and everything to the west of you converges from your perspective. That's why the sun can appear to rise due east and set due west. Okay, let me um, crop these and set them side by side and have them rotating in the same direction, the, the crepuscular rays and the, the stars, just to get an idea. You'll see the similarity.
Here's a commonly asked question or a point brought up frequently by the flat earth debunkers. If all the stars are rotating counterclockwise around a northern celestial center, wouldn't the stars viewed from the equator and you're looking out south, shouldn't the stars appear to drift left or right counterclockwise parallel to the ground, continuing the rotation that we see around Polaris in the north? Wouldn't we in fact expect to see that? Right? And that's what a lot of people ask. Well, the answer is no, because look at the crepuscular rays and the anti-crepuscular rays, right? As I showed, if you connect the sun rays to the sun while it's on the horizon, like Polaris would be if you're at the equator looking north, Polaris would be on the horizon. And what I showed with the crepuscular rays is if you connect the rays and you rotate it counterclockwise, you would see as you look to the opposite horizon, the anti-crepuscular rays would be rotating clockwise and converging. So that's what we would expect to see. We wouldn't expect to see the crepuscular rays diverging out from the sun, and then as they go over our head and head for the opposite horizon, continue to spread out, because that's not what we see. We don't see that in nature. What we see are crepuscular rays that are diverging out from the sun, and as we look to the other horizon, we see a convergence of sun rays called anti-crepuscular rays. They don't continue to spread out. They converge to a point on the opposite horizon because the precedent is set with the crepuscular and anti-crepuscular rays. The fact that they reconverge on the opposite horizon shows us that the stars would have a counter rotation in the south. So if the crepuscular rays spread out from the horizon and then continue to spread out on the other side of us like this, then yes, you would expect to see the stars circling counterclockwise when you look south from the equator. You would expect to see them moving left to right and just staying parallel to the ground and just as though one big dish with the center connected, you know, being Polaris or the northern celestial pole. You would expect to see that. That's if we saw the sun rays do this. The crepuscular rays just keep spreading out onto the opposite horizon. But we don't see that. The, the crepuscular rays become anti-crepuscular rays and they have a convergence. Right, so they oh, diverge out from the sun. Now they converge. In both bundles, so right? I don't know why people fight. The precedent this. <laughs> again is set that the stars would do a similar thing. I just want to remind you about perspective. Perspective causes everything above us to angle downward. Right, the floor angles up, and the sky, all everything above you angles down. Look at these pictures of clouds. Right, they all angle down to the horizon. Everything angles down to the horizon. So does the sun, moon, and stars on a flat Earth. So. You can estimate that the uh, celestial perspective, or how far can we see visually objects that are high up in the air, is about 6,000 miles, because that's where everything sets, about a 6,000 mile radius, right? A 12,000 mile diameter circle of vision. Uh, I don't know that's how he missed that. It was actually the radius of Earth. Forms, makes way more sense. Is where he just said, he said in the beginning that he pulled that number out and he horizon. just made it up, but it's close. It's so not quite. Keep that in mind now. 3959 radius. The, uh, how the stars are. Diameter. Let's say the stars actually spread out for you know hundreds, thousands of miles. Let's say, and let's say we can't see them all. We can only see the dome of our perspective vision, which is about a twelve thousand mile diameter circle or six thousand mile radius. That's all the stars we can see, and the stars lower. <laughs> Notice how he drew it exactly to the equator and the equatorial diameter that I that I put it at for seven thousand nine hundred eight miles. I don't know why he keeps saying twelve thousand. He, he does draw it exactly to scale from what I was saying, coincidentally. To our to the horizon at the edge of that circle, of a 12,000 diameter circle. So as you move, this dome of stars moves with you, or your dome of vision, I call it. Anyway, so let's, let's check it out. Well, just like, let's say you're standing at the North Pole, right? And the stars rotate, you have Polaris overhead and the stars are rotating around you counterclockwise. As you move south, Polaris starts to lower in the northern sky, and the stars start to tip. It's almost, I like to think of it as a, like a salad bowl, right? And so the salad bowl has the bottom is up, that's where Polaris is, and the rim of the bowl is on the ground. That's also where the sun would go around, from your perspective at the North Pole. This is one of the best animations to explain it, I think. It gets used all the time. Right, so as the sun circles over, it appears to rise and set for each person as it comes into the limit of their perspective and then out of it again each and every day. So as you head south, the salad bowl starts to tip onto its side. And um, so that let's say you travel 3,000 miles south of the North Pole 
everything would be rising in the northeast, sweeping out over the southern sky and setting in the northwest, like this, right? And if you go all the way to the equator, Polaris would now be sitting on your northern horizon. The solid bowl would be completely tipped on its side, and half of it would be below the horizon. And now all the stars would be coming up east to west, and so the sun would also rise east to west. And now that's a hard one to visualize. Because if the stars are all rotating like a big disk around Polaris in the sky, a big flat disk, or if they're not a disk, they're a big dome, whichever one they are, if that's the case, and, and if it's a big flat disk and it's just a perspective that's bringing the stars down, well then the people in the south say, hey, well the stars should be rotating just above the horizon, right? And stay equidistant to the horizon as they go around counterclockwise. That's what they'd say we should see. But that's not what we should see. We should see a clockwise southern rotation of the stars. See, we already know from crepuscular and anti-crepuscular rays how perspective works on a grand scale. I mean, that's over 12,000 miles. You see the sun rays diverging out from the sun, and then perspective converges them down to the other horizon. That's over a 12,000 mile span. Yeah, and just a little quick side note here. I, as I was doing the video, I thought of this. It's like, wow, we could see the sun, right? That's 6,000 miles away from us when it's rising. And if it's throwing out crepuscular rays and then anti-crepuscular rays, and the anti-crepuscular rays are going another 6,000 miles to the other side where they're converging, that's a 12,000 mile total. How is it we can see that on a ball? I mean, that seems to work for a flat Earth, but how does it work for a ball? Anyway, just a thought. And another objection or question I've heard is on a, on a flat Earth, how can four people around the, the Earth, like these guys here, how can they all see the same stars at night? Well, as you notice there, the stars are rotating around, right? I'd ask the question also visual. is, well, how do we see the same sun? Well, we all see the same sun because the sun rotates around and gives us our daytime. Well, the stars rotate around at each other's nighttime. Okay, now I'm gonna show each guy, starting with the top guy, there's his little dome of uh, perspective or his uh, field of view, that viewing circle, right? 6,000 mile radius. And the second guy has his night and he sees the same stars. Third guy, the stars rotate around, he sees the same stars. And now the fourth guy, there you go, he sees the same stars. And uh, that's how that works, right? So now the question begs in, and I came up with this question working on this video. And so I'm gonna beat anybody to it, is how can Sigma Octantis be fixed in the sky? If in fact it is, they say it is, okay, I'm going with it. Okay, this is so simple, right? Let's look, take a look at these crepuscular rays, all right? Now, this is a non-convergent crepuscular ray picture. I just want you to see, okay, that's where you would, if I told you to look out at the end of that crepuscular ray, where would you expect it to be? You might point out there and then say, no, it's not there, it's over here, it's converged. 12,000 miles from the sun, the ray has converged to a point. Okay, let's pretend that these are the stars rotating for a second around Polaris, and let's say Sigma Octantis is uh, rotating 12,000 miles from the North Pole, and I want you to see that it's gonna sweep across your entire field of view. In reality, but visually, you're not gonna see that because as we converge these lines the way they're supposed to be, they're gonna all go to a point. Even though it's circling across your field of view, it's still gonna be converged Doing at one point because it's 12,000 miles from the source or 6,000 from the observer. Everything converges at that point. And so there you have Sigma Octantis sitting still all night long. talk about the azimuthal grid of vision as we call it or the personal dome model or the man's arc of horizon it's best to go into stellarium over here so we have just a regular a regular view of nighttime stellarium with uh, atmosphere turned off and we can see we have the azimuthal grid turned on which places this dome above the observer and puts elevation angles around for easily navigating now the way they do this is through different coordinate systems so they pretty much took longitude and latitude and converted it to right ascension and declination so they're pretty much the same they just took longitude and latitude and turned it into right ascension and declination so declination is latitude right ascension is longitude 
they essentially mean the same except they're taken in different measurements so declination obviously is in degree arc minutes and arc seconds and the difference here is when you get to right ascension actually in hours degrees and minutes so here right here is a good example of how they do the celestial coordinates and that's how they work in relation to each other now to get a grasp quickly on equatorial grid versus azimuthal grid I'm gonna let my buddy here explain it my good Glober buddy different locations will see different stars near zenith or meridian and so we started with the subjective perspective the situation we as a beginner observer are most familiar with and if we I mean, the night sky is not really a sphere, it's the eternity of space, but from us it looks like a hollow sphere with the stars pinned to the inside, and like nearly oh, all crazy. of our ancestors thought it would be one. So if we take that projection perspective and see the stars projected into a hollow sphere, we can also locate them using a grid onto that sphere. Imagine that, it's then almost every like every star projected. has its own coordinate and you can refer to it. Taking the zenith, our horizon and the north axis as a reference point, we can establish the azimuthal coordinate grid. And it has two axes. The azimuth, it's the angle from north, and the altitude, so in short, alt-az. And you can point at any star just by these two angles. And this grid is variable to your position and even the current time. We come back to that point in a sec. So next thing we notice is that the night sky is the movement of the stars. I mean, it's due to Earth's rotation, of course. And all stars, at least <laughs> here in the Northern Hemisphere, seems to Sorry. circle a point close to the North Star. The exact pole of rotation is called the North Celestial Pole. Of course, we know that all rotation is around this pole the and there is no other rotation. You can use the Celestial hmm. Pole to but he establish know that. another and even more important coordinate grid, the Equatorial Grid. You may notice the equatorial grid, we call it EQ grid from here on, is like tilted from our perspective, simply just because we are not at the true North Pole right now. It's by latitude. And as you might guess, yeah, going down depends. 90 degrees from the celestial pole will bring us to the so-called celestial equator. That's the projection of Earth's equator onto the hollow sphere. And this EQ grid is invariant to the observing point, meaning every observer will tell the same when talking about the celestial north pole and the celestial equator is the same too, no matter where you are. And like on the azimuthal grid, you can point to any star using two angles. One is the RA, say right ascension angle, given in caution, hours. Why that? Yeah, because the sky turns around every 24 hours, and so we say star A is 4 hours away right. from where star B is right now, okay? Just because it's handy. So, RA is our turning angle, and we're gonna need that later on. And then DEC, declination, that's simply the, like, elevation above the celestial equator in degree. So, there you have it. These are the two coordinate systems, now we need to talk how to use them. First we look at the azimuthal grid and why it has flaws. So this is a random night sky, we want to search say Elioth, there's a bright star over the building. So first we need a reference point to start from. In alt us we choose north, then you seek the first angle, the azimuth, to the right, that's just convention. And after doing so, you point upwards in degrees needed. Easy, isn't it? Elioth simply has in alt us 21 degree, 56 minutes altitude and 19 degree and 18 minutes azimuth. By the way, zero, zero, this is plain north at to the, the horizon. Only. Okay, and warning, 56 minutes? What? Okay, see. One degree is parted into 60 arc minutes, and one minute is parted into 60 arc seconds. That's just the way it works. So one degree is 60 times 60 arc seconds. And now for alt s, where's the flaw? See, we said the azimuthal grid is subjective and not objective. Where's Elioth one hour later? 
It's on 55 degree 52 minutes alt and 27 degree 47 minutes as. What? It moved. But our coordinate system didn't, because we didn't. It's our reference frame, not Elias. So calling a friend in the middle of the night and telling him the old us coordinates of Elias only won't give him any clues, unless he's your neighbor. And by the way, calling people at night just because of coordinate systems normally disturbs them, <laughs> whatever. And that's where the flaw is. For doing so, we need a reference frame attached to the stars, not to us. There the EQ grid walks right into the show. See, the EQ grid is fixed to the vernal equinox point where the ecliptic, that's the Earth's orbit plane, and the celestial equator Sun's intercept. Then one axis is straight up to the celestial north pole, the other is the celestial equator. And by doing so, the grid is fixed to the stars, and if the sky, I mean Earth, rotates, so does the grid. The coordinates are moving from east to west in one night. And so a star has a always Earth, the same coordinates the in the night sky, no matter where or when you are. That's the beauty of the EQ grid. So, it's then simple as this. You need to tell your scope where zero hours on right ascension is. Right, because we need to use one of the coordinate systems specifically for time. We know the translation of time is how the motion is prescribed to the sky. So if you denote the time, you denote how far it would have moved, right? Super easy. Then move along the celestial equator to match the right ascension hour angle and then move the angle up in declination until you find, say, Capella. And Capella has RA 5 hours 60 minutes and DEC 45 degrees and 59 minutes, like always. Summer, winter, north, south, morning, noon, midnight, always. But for the beginner, double watch this video. It's a bit unintuitive first, but we need it for finding stars. Because all we do, take a list of stars, say an Astro Pocket Book, and there are the RA and DEC coordinates for everyone. Canada, UK, Russia, everyone. And then everyone uses this reference frame, and then you can call your friend in the middle of the night and disturb him with coordinates of Capella, or don't. Either way, I hope you know have kind of a feeling for the main reference frames. It's very important to know... Yeah, alt as grid also works by latitude. Least, so if, if your friend lives in the same latitude on, in the same hemisphere, then finding you can coordinates. <laughs> Handhelds do this for you on computerized mounts, but you need to tell them and you should understand what they do so that you can... There's our globe lad friend explaining right ascension declination in the coordinate system of the sky. Right, so that's super easy, uh, super easy to understand, but it's also super relevant to what we're going to talk about next, which is coordinate systems. Right, so coordinate systems, essentially we're going to talk how they took the azimuthal transformation and, you know, from Cartesian coordinates to put it into a cylindrical transformation of with a ceiling of infinite height. Right, so this is how they mapped the so-called celestial sphere. They took it, it took a whole collection of personal azimuth elevation angles and altitude, and they combined them from all over the world, depending which they noticed vary on latitude, and then mapped out a coordinate system with all the stars and when everyone would see them. It seems super easy when you think about it. Right, so all points on a sphere around the origin have the same distance and celestial coordinates, and they all look like altitude alpha tube D. Right, so they take a flat 2D structure can be drawn like an A projection map as an angle around the center with an altitude as a distance from said center. Right, so, and so by doing so, they transformed into an infinitely high cylinder. So let's see how this works with Stellarium. This is the default Stellarium viewing mode. I've just added the azimuthal grid. And we're just at somewhere in the eastern United States. We're looking at a sky and it's slowly rotating above us. We zoom out. This is what we see in perspective mode. This is meant to imitate uh, close to reality as we can get. Now, if we switch the viewing mode to something called, something called orthographic, we notice the orthographic view actually resembles very much a personal azimuthal grid, literally mapped to the observer. And as you see, with this viewing mode, if we go around uh, the world, we can see this exactly maps to it. If we change it up a bit and put on the other grid, so we go from as a azimuthal grid to equatorial grid, we now see that this sphere moves with us as we go. And this exactly mirrors Walter Bislin's model, right? So here's the southern rotation as we go south. 
as it slowly rotates around this way. And we're going to go, actually, let's move this map over here. So you can see what we're talking about. We're going to go over here to the South Africa. And look, there's the Southern Celestial Pole right over there, just like is imitated and emulated in Walter Bislin's wonderful model. We go back to the north and we don't see the South Pole. We see everything rotating around Polaris. Now, if we change this viewing mode back to what we had before, let's see perspective and then it just pops right back out and there we go so coordinate system transforms are seamless it can do this so quickly because they are mathematically identical it's simply a coordinate system transfer that they've extrapolated to get the actual coordinate and mapping of the celestial sphere now we can see them side by side. We have Walter Bislin's model with a user personal as a mythical grid that follows the observer compared to the actual orthographic view of a 3D mapped celestial sphere, which moves around the observer as well. So as you can see, they are identical. If we move this, let's see, to a different observer latitude, that would be this way. Let's go about here and then we can do the same uh, within our solarium if I can find the map wherever I put it. Let's do this. There's the map. And we'll go over here. And we'll put it right there. So there we have the exact equal, right? <laughs> the exact equal observation right here as time progresses. So we have the sim. This is why I keep invoking uh, Solarium as a backing for the azimuthal grid because it exactly is a method that's used all over for specific user observer-based measurements and comparisons. We can even go to the South Pole here if I push this a little bit over here. We go back up to Solarium and we move it say to Australia. And we go back, and then we can see we actually have the same southward facing pole rotating just like just like Walter Bislin's model shows as well. By latitude. This is why I like using this model. Latitude dependent. Uh, these two things are identical. This Very is the important. actual stars mapped out with a right ascension and declination. And this is a manipulable smaller scale version showing the exact same thing. So when people poo poo on this one, but still, you know, use this one as a Bible. It's kind of goofy, right? Right, and here we have uh, a document put together by our good buddy Alan on the same thing, the Celestial Coordinate System Transfer, and how it started with an Earth-centered Earth-fixed coordinate system, which they transferred to the globular coordinate system, and only one is actually prime. So this is an excellent document we can have everyone look at. Uh, the math in here is solid, but it's a little bit complex. So it just essentially just goes through how all the coordinate systems start as a specific prime set, and then is then transferred to other coordinate systems with the you know specificity required and all the measurements would actually line up. So they're actually mathematically equal no matter which coordinate system you use, the distances actually map out. So it's the same thing as relativity with you know reference frames and the speed of light being constant in all reference frames and having covariant transformations between the reference frames so that the things can be used as laws and universal and constants actually don't switch between the, the variations in, in the coordinate system. So here's a little bit of backup math for showing exactly what I was talking about earlier. How they map the celestial sphere essentially is by taking multiple azimuthal grid and elevation angle measurements from all over the world and stringing them together to map the celestial sphere just like they did globe earth with uh, flat pictures and flat satellite images. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but it's a, it's a really, really good read. Here's all the complex math that you have to go through to do the coordinate system transfers specifically, uh, you know, depending on latitude where you are all, all across the world. And then here's the actual math again, you know, for the Z coordinate transferred to a cylindrical coordinate with uh, infinite altitude. And also there's a parametric latitude and a whole bunch of relationships that you can derive from these so from, from these equations. I'll, I'll put this to PDF in the description for everyone to take a look. And thanks to our boy Alan for putting it together. Right, so this is how we get into the other explanations of how when you see different uh, point to perspective, you see top and bottom. Right. Giving so, the daytime, also simultaneously giving the night time. This guy sent in this model in to Flat Earth Philosophy. Um, and um, this is the wheels in the sky showing exactly the interlocking wheels of the star rotation, right? He used six different perspectives. So perspective is, he brain used four, same thing. Would be. So this model um, was only showing six perspective. Um, so the, yeah, this is a map of the zodiac with the proper orientation to the sky. Um, this is also a hyperbola and then atom. So thank you very much for watching.
Right, so yeah, that demonstration, I think, is a really good illustration of the cogs in the wheel. It has, you know, the southern constellation rising and setting for six individual observers scattered around the AE map. So the one on the bottom right, of course, shows the same thing, but just for four. And the one on the top right shows the actual truth is that it's different for each observer, depending on your latitude, and you can wheel it around any which way you want. So they're all showing the same principle, the same effect, and the same and the same uh, demonstration, but they're showing different different parts of it, right? So... You can model it with four, you can model it with six, you can model it with ten. Stellarium and see stars at every any place on Earth. Right? And it works. Let's see, it looks exactly like this. Let's put it on. There's the azimuthal grid. Right? Like a little dome. That literally follows you around Earth as you look and observe stars, right? If we go to see where we are. And then we jump around. This grid literally follows us everywhere we go. Okay. Another description, literally you see in a sphere, another depiction, sphere around you, limit of your vision. Here's a wonderful slice that I probably didn't put in for long enough, but it's called the Viet Mila Taurus Proceed Radial Distance Model. It's from one of the papers that it pulled. It literally describes you know, the circular torus field around with which you can see, and it literally describes the limit of your perspective as the same shape. So I thought that was really cool. There's a couple other depictions of the same principle, you at the center of your field, and then the circle extending out around you. Obviously, this is the same, but the right one is from top down. And here we're going to look at the stereographic reality folks. Now, they're, they're kind of crazy. They're like Pac-Man Earthers, but they put together this demonstration of the sun and instead of arguing that it goes into portals, what they did was they put an azimuthal grid around each observer and they used a shadow modeling program and essentially, essentially modeled it rising and setting for any observer on Earth. And notice how it's also latitude dependent. It seems everything in the celestial sky is latitude dependent. That's amazing. So this one has exactly so it's in the a little bit in the south and you can see the information on the right shows sunset angles and, and uh, sunrise angles so it's it's a similar program to sun calc and this is showing how the celestial sphere just imitates the time that you don't see the celestial object when it's rotating away from you they pretend that it's rotating below your feet and they timed it so that it's perceptually identical so the same amount of time it would take for the sun to go around and come back for you to see it as it rises and sets as it goes and comes from you they just say that actually when you don't see it it's below your feet circling <laughs> infinity through some nonsense and it happens to come back up the next time you see it but this is again an azimuthal grid observer based you manipulable based on a map you click a map and it drags this circle around the observer and it shows you elevation angles to the sun when it would rise when it would set again the latitude dependent shows how the solstice and the, the solstices actually have uh as Brian Leakey would call it, a, a happy face and a frowny face in the north in the, in the in the summer. It makes a happy face as it rises north of east and sets north of west. Uh, yeah, north of west. And in the winter solstice, it's the opposite. It's the inversion. It it rises a little bit south of east and sets a little bit south of west. And that's because it makes the circular path, which is latitude dependent. So here we have a, just a shot of the northern hemisphere stars all snapped out in stereographic view, and the southern hemisphere stars. And we're going to use that in a second. That's why I showed them separately, because we're going to have to show them combining, rotating above flat Earth, and how each observer sees them. So here's the combined model. Right? The southern stars will be the red stars out there. Here's a nice long demonstration of how the stars actually rotate over Earth. So here we have like a Bislin model, except it's real. He put real stars, real constellations, real distances. Literally, the celestial spheres flattened out and put it over flat Earth. And if we can envision how this is going to work, if you have a sphere around each observer, and you say you put someone in, let's put it in uh, Africa over here, this big continent down the middle, as a star proceeds, it whips around the corner of Australia, it appears to rise in the person to Africa, now it's almost at its zenith, and now it's going around to set. So at this whole half of a, half of a, half of the sky that we're looking at is re representing what a person can see. So as a star comes off the coast of Australia and rotates around the big swing of Earth, someone in Africa would see it appear to rise on the horizon, proceed over the horizon, you know, just like the sun does, and then go to set off the horizon. And it can be done for any person around. So if you notice in the north, it looks very easily. Uh, everyone sees 
Polaris, right? But if you put these people anywhere with a, a viewing grid of about 3959 radius or an equatorial diameter of 7,900 miles, and you took that person in the center of their 8,000 miles diameter and you put them anywhere on Earth, and you put all these stars above them, they wouldn't see all the stars on Earth at one time. That's silly, provably wrong. But they would see stars, you know, appear to rise and set over them because of your atmospheric lensing, the personal dome, man's arc of horizon, whatever you want to call it. The amount of visual space that you can see on the celestial sky is limited and it causes things to rise and set as they come and go, right? Just like the sun, just like the sun doesn't go below your feet when you don't see it, it just goes far away. So it comes closer to you and it rotates over you and then it goes further away. It comes and it goes and the stars are doing the exact same thing. So we're just mapping on the distance to be identical to the sun. Hebrain said a lot, 12,000 miles, but again, it makes most sense when you put it at 3959 radius, and then you can see that it matches the elevation angles to Polaris, and then all the latitude derivations from there actually match perfectly. So I'm just going to let this one play out. I think it's pretty long. It has the zodiacs also on the other side. If you picture David Weiss's app, right, it's kind of like that, except way more accurate and realistic. And if you had like one of those atmospheric lensing domes that people emulate the sun with, you could put it on this map at any point and the stars overhead would like rise and set. Similar to that uh, record video that Witsit put around. Where you put a personal dome over the record with spinning lines and it would appear to give the southern rotation. So this guy even has the sun's path mapped out as the ecliptic too, but. So this is all that's ever happening, right? For everyone, one axis of rotation, static stars turning east to west, 15 degrees per hour all day, every day in perpetuity. This is the sidereal rotation. This is the only measurement of motion that's ever been taken anywhere on earth. They've miscalculated it for Earth spin in many different ways, with many different gyros and interferometry experiments. They've tried to prescribe it mistakenly to Earth spin, but it matches the rotation of the sky. The Sagnac and interferometry that they had to use to measure it used to be having to aim at the actual rotation, which is literally aligned with the sky. So all of measurements of motion have only ever come from the sky. It's just a really cool video. I think I put the whole thing in here. I right, so notice that there is no pole, southern pole star here. This is just all the southern stars existing on the outer edge, rotating around all of flat Earth, and then appropriately rising and setting to each person, and then rotating around that perspective induced counter rotation. P range so aptly, P range so aptly pointed out. I'm gonna have to use this video for something else. I gotta put the real stars over it. Very similar here. All the stars static rotating around everyone, but our one little observer, as he moves in the south, gets his own optical convergence point that travels with him. And look, latitude dependent again. All the big, I think, flat earthers have had this idea, but haven't quite articulated it and put it together. I think Dubai has a, a clip coming up that we're going to have, have to add into it to include perspective. But P-Brain laid the foundation. Uh, here's the same image that I was talking about before. So the southern stars are the red ones. They rotate around. And as this guy goes, he sees these stars just rise and set and around a perspective-induced focal point. And it, it has to be, you only see it in the south because of the distance of your spherical you know uh, perception dome 3959 you have to travel 4,000 miles away you have to travel far enough to not see the center for the perspective induced counter rotation to be visible and that's exactly the reason right the, the reason you don't see them north is the distance this is stellarium it's in a viewing mode called fisheye and it pops out both poles like this to be viewable from the observer 
And this is pretty much star trails at the celestial equator. I'm just gonna let this roll with some music for a minute. Same thing that we saw on the flat earth side. It's just from a user's perspective, from a one observer at the equator. If you picture the Bislin model too, it's exactly what the observer is seeing. Almost two poles. It's literally how it works in reality. So here's this little personal grid centered over the observer. Here's what it looks like in Stellarium, overlaid it. I've done every position I could think of from the middle of the North Pole to 45 degrees uh which means halfway between the north pole and the equator i've modeled it there i've modeled it here's the actual view in stellarium to show you how the actual stars look when you look at the night sky and then here's how it's mirrored and kind of bringing this whole thing together this whole take back the sky for those with the eyes to see movement we need to take back the argument of the sky so i'm just going to let this roll for a minute it's got some nice music Sort of putting it all together here. All right, so we mapped the orthographic stellarium view of the actual stars to the latitude dependent observer based azimuth of greater Volta Bislam. Use it for his demonstration. As he says, the equator, the stars rotate around two poles or only appear to rotate around two poles, right? And as you go south, you no longer see the North Pole because you're so far away. And then you see the perspective-induced counter-rotation rotating the other way. The thing about it is that it does lend itself very much to the globe, as I started with. Right, so because it's a coordinate system transform from a stereographic view to, say, a celestial sphere view to a perspective view to an orthographic view, it's all just coordinate system transform. So I can't say in good faith that it doesn't work for the globe. I can only say that it works equally valid for both. Just like Einstein said in the theory of relativity that an Earth rotating around the sun and a sun rotating around the earth were visually indistinct and were inseparable and you know due to a coordinate system transfer are actually identical so the same thing happens with the sky right? i can't say that it doesn't work on a globe it actually lends itself pretty well to a globe that's how they convince millions of people that we actually lived on a curved sphere with a radius 3959 instead of living on a very large flat plane with a viewing radius of about 3959 of all the celestial phenomenon on on the earth So this is just more of that orthographic view and Stellarium at the equator, which anyone can test out and notice that it's exactly the model that Bislin used and incorporated into his wonderful flat earth dome model. So thanks, Walter. We're going to be using that at the end. Right, straight orthographic view of stars rising and setting east to west for each observer as they rotate above the flat earth. You don't see forever. You have a limit to your view. You can't see all the stars in the sky that there are. Right, You see some stars in the north that you can't see in the south and vice versa. So it makes sense that you, though you can't see the whole sky, you would appear to see the ones that come and go as rising and setting.
Let me sort of tie it all together here. We're going to have Dubay explain uh, the law of perspective as it applies to the sky and also our steel observations. Globe Earthers are taught that the reason the North Pole Star cannot be seen from southern locations like Australia or New Zealand is because it is hidden behind the supposed curvature of their globular Earth. Similar to what is taught about boats disappearing beyond the horizon, they claim these boats and the Pole Star are disappearing behind the physical curvature of a globe, and insist if the Earth was truly a stationary plane that Australians should have no trouble viewing Polaris. The fact of the matter is that all stars positioned north of a southbound traveler gradually decline overhead the farther the observer travels southwards, just as all stars positioned south of a northbound traveler gradually decline overhead the farther the observer travels northwards. Likewise, all stars located north of a northbound traveler gradually rise overhead the farther the observer travels northwards, while all stars located south of a southbound traveler gradually rise overhead the farther the observer travels southwards. This phenomenon has absolutely nothing to do with the supposed curvature of a globe, and everything to do with the law of perspective which dictates that the angle and height at which an object is seen diminishes the farther one recedes from the object, until at a certain point the line of sight and the seemingly uprising surface of the Earth converges to a vanishing point, in this case the horizon line, beyond which the object becomes invisible. Thomas Winship wrote, If we select a flat street a mile long, containing a row of lamps, it will be noticed that from where we stand, the lamps gradually decline to the ground, the last one being apparently quite on the ground. Take the lamp at the end of the street and walk away from it a hundred yards, and it will appear to be much nearer to the ground than when we were close to it. Keep on walking away from it, and it will appear to be gradually depressed until it is last seen on the ground and then disappears. Now, according to the astronomers, the whole mile was only depressed about 8 inches from one end to the other, so that this... Whoa, looks like Discord disappeared. Hold on one second. <laughs> uh... Huh. I think I closed Discord. All right, you're back. You're good. There we go. Yeah, Discord crashed. All good? All good. Eight inches could not account for the enormous depression of the light as we recede from it. This proves that the depression of the pole star can and does take place in relation to a flat surface, simply because we increase our distance from it, the same as from the street lamp. In other words, the further away we get from any object above us, as a star, for example, the more it is depressed, and if we go far enough, it will sink, or appear to sink, to the horizon, this and is then the disappear. 69 miles Furthermore, per degree relationship. Globe Earthers right. always mention visibility issues, specifically with Polaris, because it can only be seen by observers north of the equator, which could seemingly fit their narrative of disappearing due to curvature. Many other stars and constellations, however, are visible for a much wider spectrum of observers, far beyond what would be possible on a globe. For instance, Ursa Major, very close to Polaris, can be seen from 90 degrees north latitude, the North Pole, all the way down to 30 degrees south latitude. The constellation Vulpecula can be seen from 90 degrees north latitude, all the way to 55 degrees south latitude. Taurus, Pisces, and Leo can be seen from 90 degrees north all the way to 65 degrees south. Aquarius and Libra can be seen from 65 degrees north to 90 degrees south. The constellation Virgo is visible from 80 degrees north down to 80 degrees south. And Orion can be seen from 85 degrees north all the way to 75 degrees south latitude. Observers on a ball Earth 
regardless of any supposed tilt or inclination, should not logically be able to see this far. And once again, rather than the declination of the pole star proving the globe, it provides yet more evidence that Earth is a stationary plane. Hmm, nailed it. Simplistic. I love it. So we're gonna, now we're going to go real quick, speed through the Southern Cross observation from three southern points at the same UTC, right? So this picture shows the observation time, doesn't show anything directionally. Those directions are all wrong, right? And then here's the main principle of the argument against us, that they have different angles, and they cop out by put, putting it at infinite differences, as we talked about with the coordinate system transfer. So We have the Atmos, he is diamagnetic and conforms to the shape of Earth's magnetic field. And this causes the atmosphere or atmos to form a dome-like lens. So we are looking through an atmospheric dome lens when looking at the stars. I hope this is enough for globe believers to understand. So take care guys, I'll see you in the next time. Bye bye. So this was him going over the Southern Cross observation, but he was going over how he couldn't see it at the same time because uh, it was nighttime there and time zones, but I think he since rescinded that, so we're just gonna let it go. Because obviously it's the same at the same ETC. We have those observers that we started with that, you know, one's at dawn, one's at dusk, and one's about midnight. So that makes sense for the light distribution pattern on flat Earth and how a user or a personal azimuthal grid would make those observations right, make sense. So I sense. saw this flat Earth banjo, I think this was his video, about how this observation is impossible because they don't understand time zones. And it's kind of, I think, in my opinion, either inaccurate or disingenuous on purpose. Because we can show that it is nighttime in all three of these locations, just not midnight. And I'm not sure if he assumes that it has to be midnight to make the Southern Cross observation, which, you know, according to Stellarium, is inaccurate. If you look at each of these observer locations in Stellarium at the same ETC, you can see that the cross, or at least the portion of a cross, is visible in all three, all three locations. It is just barely visible, mind you, in one of the locations, but but it kind of works. So if you, uh, I'll show you in just a second what I mean here. I'm showing you how a single star on flat Earth can be visible from uh, three locations simultaneously. You know, somewhere in West Australia, somewhere in. Uh, Africa and somewhere off the coast of Brazil. So if we look over here, it's over there in uh, Australia. If we move the observer around, you can see. Let's say that, let's say that this is the star we're going to look at for all three observers right here, and this is the star in the sky that we're emulating right on the where each person would see it based on this azimuthal grid placed on the observer. So if we move this around, we see this guy sees it right over there, almost at its horizon. This guy would see it almost at its zenith, right, right over here. And this guy would see it almost setting on this side. So this is the same star over here. It's over there. And we move it along. Now it's above him. And now it's over there. It kind of makes more sense without these goofy light rays on. But if we look at it, you see it now. So here's, here's where this guy would see it right here. Here's where this guy would see it. Moved up to about here. Right? And then here's where the final observer sees it. Rotated all the way around almost completely. Right? And that's what lines up with Solidarium observations for things like the Southern Cross at the same ETC in all three of these locations. So, not impossible. Doesn't have to be midnight in each location to see this. Alright, so here's the observations. This is from Australia. Almost setting. East Johannesburg. Right, south-southwest. And then almost due south. From Brazil. But south southwest southwest on a globe don't make sense if they have to look off the edge to see the same star right like so if if it's not due south then they're looking southwest off the bottom of a ball to see the same star doesn't make any sense the only way that it could possibly make sense is if you adapt the same thing that stellarium adapts to show you how stars work in a personal observer based as a mutual grid then the declination and the SV the angles match perfectly even on a globe it's tough to say like i said can't say it doesn't work on a globe it's coordinate system transport equal is another demonstration with the map showing the directions showing the overhead star showing the three observations from solarium and then the left hand demonstration 
without changing the time, move the uh, observer base grid around the map to have each star visible at a different declination, but still nighttime, right? So that one's super easy. We went through it super quick, but there's a whole bunch of videos on it out there. It's just something that Globers always bring up. So that's that's pretty much the video presentation. And I do want to go through Bislin's model for a bit, a quick like one-on-one -on -one demonstration. But if anyone has questions, now would be a good time. What do you guys think? Yo, I think this was amazing. I sort of thought no one heard me for a while. <laughs> I've been, I've missed a lot of it because I've been working, but like, yeah, like I I think you give the the globe too much credit, man. Like, I don't even think it works on a globe when you really start putting perspective into play. Like, it kind of just makes the globe not even make sense. Well, I mean, they have coordinate system I mean, transforms. Not... <laughs> like, they can make it make sense in any coordinate system, as relativity will tell you. <laughs> It's insane, man. Yeah, when you, I guess, I guess you're right. Yeah, when you add a, a transform like that, sure. But like, <laughs> but like, people don't realize how badly they're being fooled. But if the uh, if the uh, thing is scientifically impossible, then obviously it won't make sense. Right. Well, so so here's the business model. Let's go through it real quick. A real quick tutorial on how all stars work. Right. Now this dome, this little mini dome, isn't uh, to scale, but it's to only represent the visual limit of any observer. It's got nothing to do with a personal dome or a firmament. It's just representing the limit any any person can see over you know over flat Earth. Now, as Dubé just explained, we can't see all of the sky. No one can see all of the sky. Therefore, if the Earth is flat and we can't see all of the sky, you must assume there's a limit on your perspective as far as the celestial objects are concerned. And this little personal dome model is what is that's what it's emulating, right? So. The whole thing is that it's latitude dependent. If we start in the north and we move our observer, say, halfway to the equator, we see that Polaris and the center point of rotation dips to 45 degrees. That's exactly what you would see when you map out elevation angles to Polaris, 3959, right? If you're under, under it, that's where we started. And then if you go, so if you take a look, it's spinning, you know, counter counterclockwise in the north. As they rotate, they rise and set. Super, super easy. We're going to move our observer back over to the equator a little bit. There we go. And now we can see it dips to almost where you can't see Polaris, which is what we started with, with the equatorial star trails. You can't really see either source of rotation, but they rotate around you like this. Super easy. You can't see anything else. That's latitude dependent. So you can move this guy all the way around. At this latitude and his position of the poles will not change right that's the same for flat and for globe absolutely and it definitely works in the north so any anywhere in the north is equal for the latitude you can move this around everywhere and everyone sees this right so if we go back to the equator we move it past the equator we start to see this optical convergence point that pre ring pointed out the anti-rotation sort of pop out and if we rotate it around, you can see that there's an anti-rotation there. And as the stars rotate clockwise, that rotates counterclockwise. Super easy. Optical convergence point. Latitude dependent. You only see it in the south because the radius of the sphere that you can see is 39.59. That's pretty much it. Like the, uh, you think, if you think of it like giant clock hands, I think it can help too. Like, uh, and like the center of the clock is in the middle. And then... Sigma Ontantis, all it really is, it's just the star at the very edge of the minute hand. It's like the furthest out on the clock hands. That's why it looks like a pole star. Yeah. Yeah, and the, when it, it, its appearance to rise and set just does the tiny little rotation. Tiny little yep, circle. Yep, yep. What, else, what else do you guys think? We all good. Uh, job. I'm in. I'm in storage, and I'm. I'm. I'm buried with stuff. So, but uh, awesome job. Very good. Uh, I think you said something about eight thousand mile uh, as compared to twelve thousand mile. Yeah. In diameter. Yeah, because he he guessed at twelve thousand miles, and I'm I'm more guessing that it's a, a radius of thirty nine fifty nine to match elevation angles to Polaris, which 
puts it at a circle around you of an equatorial diameter of about 7,908. So I rounded up to, say, 8,000 miles because he kept saying 12, and that, that doesn't work with most math. 8,000 works with all the math, so that's why I say that. Oh, okay, yeah, because then it's 12,000 12, for the whatever, quote-unquote, official quote of the diameter. I didn't know what you were trying to get at, but that, I got gotcha. you. Oh, P-Brain kept saying that it was 12,000 miles, and you would see it rise and set within that. He's saying that the celestial personal sphere grid is 12,000 miles, and I kept, I, I disagreed, right? I said, oh, he was he was going by their 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 estimate of the diameter right which is twelve thousand something right no no he said he made it up he was just guessing that's literally oh. what he said <laughs> like in the beginning you know i'm just gonna say All it right. let's just say it that's how he brought it up and i was like okay i got gotcha. you okay and the, the principles work the same so i didn't really pick them too bad but it actually the math works right. from elevation angles to polaris at 3959 so it's almost like they knew that you could see in a celestial sphere at about 3959 and they were like actually you live on a sphere a radius 3959 it was definitely a bait and switch i got you yeah somebody else uh, chime in because i'm i'm doing i'm in storage and probably cutting out awesome job though uh yeah this this was a great presentation dude your your visuals are epic and you have the best <laughs> visuals out there that's hands down <laughs> and that's like hugely helpful to <laughs> to put it all together and to see it because there was one side like for those who lack imagination i'm like shit i might lack imagination because it, it wasn't for these visuals <laughs> um it'd be difficult to put it together but um you know the one part that i uh that i'm still trying to meditate on is um the anti-corpuscular effect causing that counter rotation and so if i'm just trying to you know, if you can recap um it has something to do with the distance because the distance is great enough to get that effect when you reach the equator yeah it's literally because i'm saying that you can see in the celestial sphere of 3959 right so that's the radius you can see in front back behind to the left all around it gives you a sphere of about you know a diameter of about 8,000 miles so to get 8,000 miles away from the center i mean that's how far you'd have to be to see it, right? Like to see the actual South Pole. You are you have to be at the equator to not see Polaris anymore. And only when you can't see Polaris anymore and you've exceeded the distance of the, the your sphere radius or, from the object, that's when you see the perspective-induced counter-rotation. Okay, so, so if I was standing at the North Pole and Polaris is right above me, the star, and let's say I'm just facing a direction, every direction is south at that point, but let's just say I'm facing a direction and I see a star kind of close to the horizon, let's say that's about 3,900 miles away. And um, the star that's close to the horizon that direction. And then I turn 180 degrees, and I look in the opposite horizon, and then there's another star that's another 3,900 miles away. So that's about 8,000 miles di diameter. Right. Uh, but you're not gonna get any kind of anti-crepuscular effect at that distance or or you know is it something to do with the phenomenon of like the north pole being kind of the center of the system and that's what you need to get far away from to see a you know a counter rotation well, follow it's, me a little bit yeah it's, it's both those things really right like so it's because you're too close to the center and because of the distance of how you how far you can see because everyone in the north is too close to the center to see a counter rotation because their sphere of vision that makes them see the actual source of rotation, right? But only if you get for 4,000 miles away from it, when you can no longer see it anymore, then your other 4,000 miles extended in the opposite horizon, you would start to see the beginnings of the counter rotation or like, you know, the daytime version would be the anti corpuscular rays at that, right? And then the nighttime version is the actual star rotation, perspective induced counter. Right. right, okay, uh, so to wrap my wrap, to wrap my mind around the phenomenon you know there are stars so let's say you are in the north pretty close to the northernmost pole but let's just say alaska or something there are stars that are five thousand six thousand miles on the opposite side of the of the earth in a sense like um uh like like you have polaris you're looking at polaris and stars that are closer to the horizon while you're looking north at polaris those stars are far away right um and so 
does do you reach that maximum distance to get this kind of phenomenon of a of a crepuscular than anti crepuscular effect from those further stars? Wait, what? Okay, so like I'm looking at the North Pole, but if I were to gaze down further towards the horizon while looking north, I'll see stars. Wait. You know that are. Are you rotating the around the north? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm. Let's say I'm in Alaska or somewhere close to the north. So the okay. so so you know the North Pole is kind of off, still on an angle, all right. And um, if I gaze closer to the horizon, I'll be looking at other stars that are even further in that direction than the North Pole is to me. And um, so I, I guess my question yeah. is, would those, would those stars have a similar crepuscular, anti-crepuscular effect? No, the, the only comparable facet of an anti-crepuscular ray is the actual counter-convergence point that you see in the south, right? So the, the, the convergence point is perspective-induced at great distance. You have to get far enough away from the center which with the which which given the you know the radius of how you, how far we think you can see has to be at the equator. So people always ask how come we can't if it's perspective induced how come we can't see it in the north? Right? It's because it's such a, over a great distance that you have to be that far away from the center for you to start to see it. Almost exactly like Bislin's model shows here. If you change the latitude, mm -hmm. right? Like this is watching this is how it literally made sense to me. Like so far away, there it is. There's the bull. There's the bull. And then you get to the equator, and then up oh, right over there, it starts to pop up. And then literally everywhere on this latitude, all around the world, you see the same thing. So it's not a physical mm -hmm. point at the bottom of a ball. It's a perspective-induced counter-rotation. That means that, let's say that this is like, you know, a, a star. Let's say that this is the this southern cross for this guy. As this rises and sets, so as I move it back, let's see. As this rises for the guy, say it's going to be this one right here. Or like, or actually, it'd probably be this one right here. So... As this rises, so as the pink one sets up, there it is, coming around the convergence point, and it rises, it's almost at zenith, it goes all the way down, and it sets. And that, that's exactly what's happening for everyone at that latitude. <laughs> that's why they can say, oh, it's a physical point, because they just look at the latitude. And everywhere at the latitude, even on a globe, this is how far the convergence point would be. And that's how it travels that way, right? And no one ever sees it past here, because no one can ever say anything past the 60th parallel. So if, if you get maybe 45 degrees on the south celestial pole is the farthest most people will ever see it so what you're saying is mm -hmm. that it's latitude it's it's basically only at that latitude that you see the effect and when you go further it changes yes sir it's exactly dependent on latitude it's almost like i've been saying this for five years okay And um, so are you still saying um, that the, the stars south of the uh, equator um, are uh, replicas of the northern stars or mirrors <laughs> of the northern stars? I mean, <laughs> yeah, to be totally unrelated to this, but yeah, uh, the southern stars probably aren't really even themselves independent. They're probably just parabolically like mirrored northern reflections that the further south you go, again, latitude dependent the more skewed and elongated they become, which means they're harder to match right. up to like a straight, a straight match. But there's definitely videos that show that correlation cool. where the clusters line up. So, so the Southern stars are, uh, uh, I don't know what it's called the magnitude or luminance or what the word is, but they are, they are much weaker light sources than the Northern stars. Also, I, I used to have a video of someone who found the exact replica star system and um it was just inverted in the south compared to the north so it's highly likely that there is some some like reflective quality in the south depending you know how far you're looking uh, that's just really interesting i wish i had that video again but uh he he was able to find a cluster of stars that were literally inverted at um a certain position in the sky um so nice that would be it really would be cool interesting to, to try to, you know, match them up on our own and see if we can find any more. Um, but it would probably be at a certain ring in the sky where they would be more similar because the further out they are, they'd probably be too different. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like the latitude dependence. So only like at the equator and beyond, 
and there's definitely like correlations for the stars like as eric said the ursa major the big dipper can be seen over the greatest greatest distance but that's the one that has the easiest to see mirror over the celestial equator is one that looks just like an inverted big dipper like <laughs> that's the easiest one to line up and that's the baseline for all the other comparisons really trying to find that picture of the stars that i stole from geo that's like the map around let's see this one like th that map i think is is pretty good here let me bring the stream over to see it right so of all the red stars are the southern stars because they're the ones furthest out towards the edge. Those are the ones that as they approach you, you would see rise and appear to orbit around an optically celestial pole and then appear to set around the other way. Those those are all the stars that would do that. When I kind of saw that, it made sense. I think Geo asked the question with that. I'm like, well, yeah, no, it's exactly this. It's, it's exactly this map, except each each observer has a you know celestial grid around them of about 39.59 and sees them rise and set. And depending on your latitude, as a, how far south you go, that's how high in the sky the optical convergence point or counter rotation will appear. Yeah, man, good good work, Shane. This is, uh, I think this puzzle piece is going to help us find some other stuff now that we know what to look for. Nice. To, to me, the, the sky is like the big one because, like, it's the one that brought me over to look at it. Just, I'm not understand what the heliocentric explanation was, but it's also... The one that flat earthers didn't want to explain the most and to me it's like the most important one it's the biggest factor on why people think the earth's the globe it's the biggest factor that keeps people there if you know that crazy lady trouble about she didn't understand the sky so bad that she went back to the globe and now she's one of the worst people ever so like it's 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 one of the most important things to understand i think Yeah, and I would just add that it's it's the most uh, you know fascinating to meditate on you know and and try to open your mind to because it does require a new way of kind of seeing how perception works and even the limit of visibility. That's a fascinating thing to just open your mind to. Honestly, I think it's the hardest thing about flat Earth to explain is the stars. Maybe someone can correct me, but I like I had no problem with electrostatic downward acceleration and gravity being chucked out and pseudoscientific nonsense redshift being explained by electromagnetic retardation and uh, you know all that shit makes perfect sense that that was easy the sky was hard yeah hey and just in case uh trouble bot is listening um one of the things that is important to clarify and what you're saying here which wasn't wasn't completely clear with um, what the uh, P brains video was showing because a lot of people could misinterpret it as him saying that the southern stars are reflections of the northern stars because of the way the the sun is kind of seeming like it's a it's an anti crepuscular um, uh, thing coming from the one source of the sun, but it's not to say that those stars aren't real stars, right? It's just that they appear to be going the other direction once you reach a certain point. Yeah, they're they're not reflections of the northern stars, which a lot of people confuse with this idea. Yeah, they have flat earthers. <clears throat> Thank you for clearing that up. That, that yeah. was actually something I was curious about, but I wasn't quite sure how to phrase it because I kind of <laughs> forgot about it. But yeah, that's absolutely a great that's that's a great question. Thank you. So wait, is that, that is that a point up for uh, debate whether or not that is the case? Are you saying? You're you're pretty confident that those that they are their own stars in the south, and they just have that convergence, counter convergence, rotation. Well, um, whether they're parab parab parabolically reflected, mislabeled northern stars or correctly identified southern stars, that's kind of separate from how they appear and how they rotate. That's why I didn't bring it up and didn't want to mix them together. But like, th that's definitely a thing I think. But it doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with the explanation for the convergence in the, in the south celestial pole. Right. Okay. Because I like, guess, yeah, as New Perspective was saying, it, it that that was how I kind of interpreted it was, okay, we're going to invoke the uh, crepuscular and anti-crepuscular rays. And the way that makes sense is you have a light source, the sun, and then those rays are converging due to perspective. And then the question is, okay, so is the northern stars the light sources that are creating this anti-crepuscular rotation? 
in the South. So that's sort of how I thought about it. But but here you're saying it, they're different. Yeah, it's the only mechanism you need to have a, a South Celestial Pole is perspective on a grand scale. That's to me, that's all you need. I don't need to invoke the firmament or a reflection or a toroidal magnetic field. Like all, all that probably probably has to play in how the stars get to the, at that place in the, in the, to get there in the first place. But it doesn't have anything to do with how I see them being able to optically rotate around uh, an optical induced celestial pole, depending on the latitude. Just like in the north, you know, latitude is dependent on elevation angles to polaris. They're identical. Your latitude equals elevation angles. Like there's a one for one relationship that's why gleam mapped that out so well and the relationship continues in the south inversely right so as far south latitude you go that's the elevation angle of the so-called optical convergence okay so it's one way to think about it is the fact that um the southern latitude on a flat earth it's just getting bigger wider more land so it's just greater distances in general as you move south and that's mapped onto the sky as well. So these larger, greater distances will make that perspective effect appear in that kind of counter rotation. <laughs> it, could, it could it could all get larger as you go out there. You wouldn't know, I guess. I don't I don't know if that's directly related. I just think that if the stars, like P Brain, he tried to illustrate if the sun was at the center of flat Earth, and all of the crepuscular rays from the sun emanating outward were just spinning around like the stars were spinning around. Like a, a lot of people lose them on that analogy. But if the sun was at the center of flat Earth and all the, all the sun rays emanating outward, you'd expect that in the south to see, you know, sun rays, no sun source, but parallel sun rays just going and arcing over your head and extending out to the end point. You'd expect to see that because that's what we're seeing. Well, why, why do we have a counter rotation in the first place? That's the, the question that we're trying to answer. And, oh, crap. <laughs> it's yeah so it's it's just the counter rotation induced by perspective you know what i forgot what i was saying dude i had a point Yeah, no, I like the I like the analogy he uses. If the sun was at the center of the flat Earth, you'd have those counter convergent rays um, after you reach a certain distance from the sun. Um, right, and that's the only ana yeah. analogous concept. Not like a point source of light or uh, even the luminosity difference. Like th th that's all kind of irrelevant to the to the analogy of just the fact that your perspective after a certain distance takes those parallel light rays and warps them into a convergence point that the light rays aren't doing an observable reality. If you had like a God's eye, bird's eye view of what that light ray was doing, it wouldn't be, you know, circling around you. It would be emanating out in perpetuity. And it's a matter of everyone's perspective that everyone sees that light ray bending around them, even though for everyone in God's eye, it's extending out in perpetuity. Is that? Have you ever seen that, <clears throat> Shane? An anti-capuscular sun? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. Saw, I, I saw it one time before I knew what it was. Right, I it remember seeing mind. it and not knowing, like, not even caring. <laughs> I was just like, "Oh, cool." Yeah. And then, like, oh, it blew me away. I was like, "What is going on? Why is the sun on this side and that side?" Nice. Well, yeah. Then we can wrap up the presentation. Go up the live stream. We still ran about two hours, man. Try to keep it under. Yeah, it was good stuff, man. I'll have to go back and watch it. I missed a lot of the early stuff. Um, it was the worst grocery delivery in the history of grocery deliveries, but <laughs> you know. at least you knew ahead of time. Yeah, <laughs> sure did, sure did. So, well, thanks everyone right. for coming and participating and watching and asking. Good stuff, man. Thank you. Hey, can you use your uh, uh, clapping soundbite there for yourself, please? <laughs> I will allow it. For the record, it will not be heard in the audio. For the record, like that, because I have it turned on. All right. Welcome to the show where you don't know if it's part of the show. Welcome to the show if 
you don't know It's my you don't show Didn't they teach you to reach for the stars While opening up the bars And keeping you chained down with mortgage bills and cars Vaccines for your arms Kids sounding like supercharged Caffeinated hate field scars And rage quit repertoires No answers for yards Caught up in emotion that's not even yours Past the truths like impeccable retards Lined up for your serving of gish gallop and wars No remedy can't save the lost in love with the yarn I'm tired of walking into refracted shards Poor science displayed by disgusting bards Soaked in sin with your dupe as delight in a new hand of cards Been so long, seems like for love I'm, I'm just too hard, I'm just too hard, I said Welcome to the show Part of the show. Welcome to the show. If you don't know, you don't know. Intoxicated eight makes you believe you're spinning in space. Why you have no shame or grace? It's a disdainful state I used to contemplate how to save myself from my own self hate. Wonder why I was even made with a dreadful fate Forced to try and awake with a full plate No one to help me stay awake or educate I've had to liberate and fight through hidden gates But my brother, heaven could never be late And rockets don't work in space It's all fake, the show is on Mars It's a joke, but you're too far gone It won't be long Fepe's beak is strong We have our song and we march along Like streams of knowledge leading to God's holy pond And lives of truth that eats the bong And sings the song that turns mankind from the wrong We come in peace with a holy gown And all of us wearing our holy crowns Said the earth is flat and we